For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Jeff Hummel. I'm going to make the talk tonight without the benefit of an introduction, because <laughs> I'm completely capable of introducing myself. First, um, I, gen I really like questions, and I like to field them while I'm giving a talk. I like to allow people to interrupt me. I think that's a lot of fun. But for this talk, I'm going to ask that all of you hold your questions until the very end, because it's a rather lengthy talk, and I've discovered that uh, many questions are answered if you allow me to go on, and for the benefit of people who are in a hurry, I'd like to be able to get through my initial remarks before I handle any questions. So for this speech, I'd like to pursue that policy. The second introductory remark I want to make is that I make no claim to originality for any part of this speech. A lot of the ideas that, I've, that I'll mention are not original with me. I've gotten them from other people, and uh, I don't have the time always to mention the sources where I get these ideas from. My primary accomplishment is, is integrating the ideas into a framework. And uh, finally, I want to warn you that the speech is, is going to be somewhat long and involved, and so I'm giving you an outline <laughs> to help you follow me. Now, now I guess I can begin. <laughs> okay, the official, the official title of this talk is How an Anarchist Society Would Provide National Defense, The Solution to Libertarianism's Hardest Problem. Well, this title is misleading, I should say, at the outset. It's slightly misleading for two reasons. The first reason is the title tends to equate libertarianism with anarchism. And as any of you who are familiar with libertarianism know, uh, the two are not synonymous. There are many libertarians, in fact, probably the majority, who are not anarchists, who are limited government advocates. They would make sure, or they would like to see defense voluntarily funded, because like all libertarians, they believe that taxation is theft and therefore immoral, but they don't believe in abolishing government. They would have this voluntarily funded national defense provided by the limited government. Now, despite the division between limited government advocates, sometimes called minarchists, and anarchists, or anarcho-capitalists, or libertarian anarchists, whichever you prefer, I've decided to focus my talk on the anarchist viewpoint for uh, three reasons. The first reason is that I am an anarchist, and I have a high preference for expounding and defending positions I agree with as opposed to positions I don't agree with. <laughs> the second reason, by the way, I should, I should add here, for how many non-libertarians do I have in the audience? Okay, I should add that by an anarchist, that means that I favor a society without government. It does not mean that I am opposed to society in general. It does not mean I'm opposed to order. It does not mean I'm opposed to law. It does not mean that I'm opposed to human organizations per se. It does not mean that I'm in favor of chaos. And it does not mean <laughs> that I'm a pacifist. It means simply that I think society would be better organized without government or without a state. Okay, now the second reason I'm focusing on the anarchist viewpoint is because the anarchist viewpoint is the more extreme, and therefore, if I can make the case for the anarchist viewpoint, I think the minarchist viewpoint follows, the limited government viewpoint follows, because most of the arguments apply to both. Most of my arguments apply to both. And the third reason that I'm focusing on the anarchist viewpoint is also the second reason <laughs> that the title of this talk is misleading. I told you it's going to be complicated. <laughs> I think that I feel that limited government libertarians are compelled by the logic of their position to seek out certain legitimate actions which governments, as long as they fall within certain prescribed, very strict guidelines, can and should undertake to provide national defense. And the problem with this is that I think that it opens the door among limited government advocates, among limited government libertarians, mm -hmm to the unfortunate tendency to apologize for, or even to advocate, many so-called defensive actions that I think are clearly immoral and unlibertarian. As an anarchist, I don't want the government to do anything in the way of providing national defense. In fact, strictly speaking, and this is the way the title is misleading, I don't believe in national defense at all. I do not believe in defense of or by nation states. I do not believe in defending nations, countries, or any other collectives. What I do believe in is defending individual rights against all aggressors, whether defined as foreign or domestic. And I don't want governments to provide this defense in any way, shape, or form. Now, some of the implications of this position, as far as the limited government anarchist split, will become clear later. 
One possible implication, I haven't really made up my mind on this, is that the Anarchist Limited Government Coalition, which forms the libertarian movement, while viable as long as libertarians continue to focus on domestic issues, may no longer be viable with foreign policy coming into the forefront. I don't know. But in any case, as for the title, I decided that if lengthening the title to how an anarchist society would provide effective defense against foreign nation states and other aggressors, <laughs> while being more precise, would, would take a, an already too cumbersome title and make it more cumbersome. And national defense, while not being strictly precise, captures what I'm talking about, captures the essence. So I've left that in the title. Okay, now that, <laughs> that really finishes the introductory remarks. And I'm ready to start with section one, the problem. What's the matter with national defense as provided by nation states? Now, I've said that this is libertarianism's hardest problem. And the reason for that is that even some liber libertarians, for instance, the limited government advocates, have a difficult time conceiving of how the market can provide defense, how defense can be provided by laissez-faire. And this is, I think, because defense has been so universally and uh, continuously monopolized by the state. And if it's difficult for some libertarians, it's obviously going to be even more difficult for non-libertarians. So I, I've almost taken on an insurmountable task, because if you're not a libertarian and you don't believe that the free market can deliver the mail and build roads and provide education and eliminate the business cycle and eliminate inflation and provide charity and all of these other things, then it's going to be even more difficult for you to conceive of the free market providing national defense. Nevertheless, I think that I need to take on this challenge because although this is libertarianism's hardest problem, I think it's libertarianism's most important problem. And the reason for that was poignantly stated by Randolph Bourne during World War I. War is the health of the state. War is the health of the state, said Randolph Bourne during World War I. One of the implications of that, what he meant, was that war in fact has been and remains, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest threat to liberty, bar none. The greatest threat to liberty is war. Almost without exception, all governments have spent more, have used more resources, have used more tax money, have devoted more energy to waging war and preparing for war than any other thing they've spent money on or used resources on. It just dwarfs everything else. And this is almost without exception. Now, in order to understand this relationship between war and the state, We've got to do a little bit more systematic analysis of the nature of war as it's fought by nation states. And in order to do this systematic analysis, you're going to have to purge from your mind the conventional collectivist model that falsely draws analogies from interactions between individuals and applies them to the interactions between nation states. According to this false collectivist model, we have two entities involved in any war or two parties nation A and nation B. And either nation A aggresses against nation B or vice versa, that's how a war starts. And the only problem that's left once you've accepted this model is figuring out which nation is the aggressor nation and which nation is the defender nation. And the aggressors are the bad guys and the defenders are the good guys. The problem with this model is that there are not two parties to any war. There are in fact at least four parties. The government that rules nation A the government that rules nation B, and the people who have the misfortune to live under government A, and the people who have the misfortune to live under government B. And thus, when war breaks out between government A and government B, two kinds of moral problems emerge. The first moral problem involves innocent bystanders. Whatever the merits of the dispute between government A and government B, very rarely are the people under government A and under government B involved. But nevertheless, when government A wages war on government B, it also wages war on the people who live under government B, most of whom are innocent bystanders, most of whom are not responsible for what, the, what their government has done. And similarly, when government B wages war on government A, it also wages war on people A. So you have this first problem, the violation of the rights of innocent bystanders. You have a second problem, and that's the violation of the rights of the people who are supposedly being defended. Whenever any government wages war, not only does it attack the innocent bystanders who live under the opposing government, but it also wages war against its own citizens. Wages war against its own citizens through increased taxation, through enslaving and kidnapping them through conscription, through government regulation of the economy, through inflation, 
through massive invasions of civil liberties, which usually tend to disappear during war. In short, during war, the power of the state takes a quantum leap, and usually it's a semi-permanent quantum leap. And this, this really is the meaning of Bourne's statement. And for those of you who are not libertarians, and also for those of you who are libertarians who still don't believe that war is the health of the state or war is the greatest danger to liberty, I want to just give a few examples of government interventions that a lot of conservatives, for instance, object to. They really emerged during war. For instance, the income tax. Everybody now talks about taxation and how evil it is. The income tax was first imposed during the Civil War in order to fight the Civil War. That's when the, the United States got its first income tax. The withholding feature of the income tax, the thing that makes tax resistance so difficult, was first imposed as a wartime measure during World War II. Central banking first emerged with the Bank of North America during the Revolutionary War. It, central banking, by the way, is the source of our inflationary problems today. The second central bank that the United States had was called the First Bank of the United States, uh, set up by Alexander Hamilton to handle the Revolutionary War debt, so that even though it wasn't set up during war, it was actually an outgrowth of war. The second bank of the United States was set up to handle financial problems caused by the War of 1812. The banking system was nationalized with the National Banking Act during the Civil War. And even though the Federal Reserve System wasn't imposed as a result of war, it actually first came into operation during World War I. Protective tariffs were first imposed as a result of the War of 1812. I could go on and on and on. Government aid to business. Substantial government aid to business in this country first began with national government subsidies to the railroads during the Civil War. But I want to, rather than go on and list all these things, I want to pick the one famous example that is usually cited as something that didn't arise during war by conservatives, and that's the New Deal. The there's a conservative myth that somehow the source of statism in this country today is Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Well, that's a myth for three reasons. First of all, everything that Roosevelt imposed during the New Deal was in fact a continuation and expansion of Hoover's policies. Secondly, the amount of government intervention involved in the Hoover Franklin Roosevelt New Deal was still very small compared to the amount of government intervention that was involved when Franklin Roosevelt finally got us involved in World War II. And thirdly, the New Deal itself was based on, was patterned after the war collectivism of World War I. The NRA was patterned after the War Industries Board, and almost every other aspect of the New Deal was a throwback to some form of government intervention that had arisen during World War I. So to reiterate, I would argue there's no greater threat to human liberty than war, at least as it's conducted by nation states. Something that I wish Reagan supporters would start reflecting upon. And whatever else that can be said about national defenses provided by government, as far as I'm concerned, a national defense that violates the rights of innocent bystanders, not only violates the rights, commits mass murder against innocent bystanders, and violates the rights of those who are supposed to be defended, is unacceptable, period. <laughs> Even if there were no alternative. Now, the moral problems with war have not been first pointed out by libertarians. There are lots of other people who've had moral objections to war. Anti-war activists and pacifists throughout history have always have complained about war. But unfortunately, the debate has always been framed in moral versus practical terms. The moral position, of course, is to be opposed to war, but the practical position is that being conquered by a foreign nation is a much worse alternative, and so national defense and war sometimes is a practical necessity. And most people faced with this terrible alternative have opted out for the practical course. Only a few visionary utopians have decided to take the moral course. Well, as a libertarian, I believe that the moral practical dichotomy is a false one. I don't think that there is any distinction between what's moral and what's practical. Just as on domestic issues, libertarians have shown over and over again that government intervention is not only unjust and immoral, but also that it doesn't work and it usually leads to consequences that are worse than the original problem that it was intended to solve. So I think the same applies to government intervention in the name of national defense. I've given you the moral case against war. What I now want to do, or war as fought by nation states, national defense as provided by government, what I now will attempt to do is give you the practical case against it. And what I will attempt to show is that government is not only an inefficient way of providing national defense, but that in fact 
government provision of national defense usually makes people far less secure than they otherwise would be without the government provision of national defense. And in the process, I, I, uh, I hope to be able to address the common variant of the moral practical dichotomy that runs, well, your ideas are really good if the whole world adopts them, but we live in the real world, and if the United States went anarchist and the rest of the world still had nation states, then we'd be in huge trouble, because I don't think that that holds. I think that, in fact, the opposite is true. Now, in making the practical case for national defense, it'll become clear that I'm not a pacifist that I believe that individuals have a right to exercise defensive and retaliatory force against aggressors, and that therefore they have a right to join together to do this, and that therefore they have a right to set up institutions, and that an anarchist society would have such institutions that would in fact provide defense without the moral problems involved with government provision of national defense. Also, I don't want to exaggerate my claims, and I can't prove that all the violations of rights of innocent bystanders can be avoided in the provision of national defense. In other words, every single property right of every single person will be respected in the provision of national defense. I mean, I'm not sure that I can't, I'm not sure that that can't be proven, but I can't show that, that I can provide national defense by respecting all rights. But at least I think that an anarchist society would provide national defense by respecting most of the rights of innocent bystanders in living under aggressor nations and, and certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have to commit the mass murder that nation states have to commit in order to provide defense. And also I don't want to exaggerate my claims. I'm not going to claim that an anarchist society will be able to defend itself under all circumstances. I don't really have to prove that. I'm not going to be able to show you that an anarchist Luxembourg will be able to satisfactorily defend itself against a militarized Germany and a militarized France. What I will attempt to show you is that an anarchist Luxembourg can do better, which is really all I have to prove. A militarized Luxembourg is also helpless against a militarized Germany and France. And I think that a militarized Luxembourg is, is in fact more helpless. Okay, so on to the practical case. And the first point I want to make in the practical case is that the need for national defense is exaggerated. It's highly exaggerated. Because war is the health of the state, because citizens tend to be able to endure more increases in government power when they perceive a foreign threat, governments have a strong incentive to exaggerate the need for national defense. Or to put it another way, because governments are running protection rackets, it's very convenient for governments to have enemies around to protect you from. And if there isn't a real enemy, they'll go out of their way to create one. My study of history, and this is something I won't be able to prove conclusively to you tonight, but I can at least hope to get you to study some more. My study of history leads me to the conclusion that in the overwhelming majority of cases of war between nation states, either government, either government could have easily avoided the war with a non-aggressive, rational, non-provocative foreign policy. For instance, I think that if you look at the history of the United States, which is the history that I'm most familiar with, you will discover that none of the wars in which the United States was involved, except for the American Revolution, were justified. Every war prior to the American Revolution, all the French and Indian Wars, every war subsequent, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, were all unjustified and all unnecessary, that the United States could have avoided those wars. Now, which is not to say that other governments could have also taken courses to avoid war with the United States in those cases. Now, to some people, this might sound like a sweeping overgeneralization, <laughs> and I don't have the time really to document the claim. What I would urge you to do is, there's a group of historians who are generally engaged in the enterprise of debunking the official myths that governments create in order to justify their participation in wars. And these historians are called revisionist historians. And what I would urge you to do is, to read revisionist liter literature yourself. And what I hope to have ready tonight, and also for the previous talk, and which I still haven't managed to do up, was was an annotated bibliography of revisionist literature for both the Cold War and World War II, since those are the most recent. And I haven't been able to get those bibliographies done. But if you talk to me after the talk, after the speech, I can give you some literature citations, or if you give me your name, I can, uh, I can give you the bibliographies when I eventually get them up, because I still plan to do them sometime. The interesting thing is that most of the very few revisionist historians are consistent libertarians. Most of the revisionist historians involved with World War II happen to be from the right. Most of the revisionist historians involved with the Cold War happen to be from the left. 
And when I make these assertions about revisionism, I usually get the most objection about World War II. And in fact, there probably, if there are any of you who are from the left in the audience, there are many of you who may have accepted Cold War revisionism in, in some of its forms and still may be uneasy about World War II revisionism. And there are lots of examples of authors like that. For instance, Stephen E. Ambrose's book, Rise to Globalism, which is a textbook about American foreign policy covering both World War II and, and the Cold War. It's mildly revisionist about the Cold War and justifies American participation in World War II, used as a textbook. Now, I think that World War II revisionism and Cold War revisionism, despite the fact that the authors tend to not, not all authors except very few of the authors, the revisionist historians except both, I think they hang together. Because one of the sources, one of the most important sources of Cold War hysteria, when it first occurred and, and recently now, has been the drawing of analogies to Hitler. And what Cold War revisionists did when they first began writing uh, during the Vietnam era was to argue that the analogies to Hitler were false. Now, because of Vietnam, Cold War revisionism was temporarily successful. And this led to an interesting paradox. As recently as three years ago, when I was participating in the teaching of courses, if you showed a typical class of freshmen or sophomores a movie taken from the Cold War era, one of those movies in which the map starts off with the Soviet Union red with a hammer and sickle, and then the Soviet Union begins reaching out, and other areas of the globe turn red, you know, first Eastern Europe and then China, and eventually the whole globe turns red and all these hammer and sickles reach and encircle the United States. People saw this movie and laughed, <laughs> which shows that they had managed to escape the Cold War hysteria of 10 years prior. But the interesting thing is that if you showed these students the same type of movie, but instead of having the Soviet Union be the source of aggression, have it be Nazi Germany, instead of the globe turning red, have it turning black, and instead of having hammer and sickles, having swastikas, they didn't laugh anymore. They took it seriously, which shows that at that period of time, we were in the paradoxical situation. Most Americans were in the paradoxical situation of having escaped the hysteria of the Cold War and yet having still been caught up in the hysteria of World War II. And I think that this is the primary reason why Cold War revisionism was only temporary, temporarily successful. Because with the invasion of Afghanistan, all the old analogies to Hitler were reapplied. And it was very easy for Cold War hysteria to be regenerated. I think it's necessary to do more than simply show that the domino theory is not true for the USSR, but does apply to Hitler. I think what you need to do is show that the domino theory is never valid. Now, there are theoretical reasons, which I'll get to later. But I think if you examine the historical literature, the revisionist literature on World War II, you'll find that the domino theory is equally inapplicable to Hitler as it is to the Soviet Union. Now, I want to quickly add, accepting World War II revisionism does not mean you become an apologist for Nazi Germany any more than accepting Cold War revisionism makes you an apologist for the Soviet Union. By recognizing that Roosevelt deliberately provoked the attack on Pearl Harbor does not mean that you believe that the attack on Pearl Harbor was a good thing. By arguing that the United States government could have easily avoided war with Japan by pursuing a rational foreign policy does not mean that Japan could also have easily avoided war with the United States by also pursuing a rational foreign policy. To take the revisionist case against the United States does not whitewash the rulers of Japan or Germany. And I want to drive this point home with an example that's a little bit more distant in the past, the Mexican-American War. The Mexican-American War, it's harder to find a clearer case of unprovoked aggression. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it's unprovoked aggression by the United States against Mexico, mainly in order to grab California, which the Mexican government was refusing to sell. There's hardly any clearer case of unprovoked aggression. Yet, it is also true that the Mexican government, at the time of the outbreak of the Mexican-American War, it was itching for war with the United States and thought that they could win that war, and that there were actions that the Mexican government could have taken to possibly avoid war. Even in this strong case of aggression, I think that there, there's still a revisionist case that you can make if you're a Mexican about the actions of the Mexican government. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave for a moment the topic of World War II revisionism, leave you all dissatisfied, but I do want to... <laughs> I do want to um, say a little bit about the Cold War. I can't really escape giving you some facts about Cold War revisionism. This is the only specific case in the general point that I'll go into. Cold War revisionism rests on the belief that both Soviet intentions and Soviet capabilities are highly exaggerated. 
We're told that the Soviet Union is bent on world conflict and that they're rapidly achieving the capability to do this. I think both those assertions are false. I first want to talk about intention. Now, when I say that the Soviet leaders are not bent on world conflict, I do not mean to imply by this that if you went to the Soviet leaders with a questionnaire, which they had answered honestly, and the questionnaire read, if you could become the absolute ruler of the entire world simply by snapping your fingers, would you do so? <laughs> I'm not going to argue that the Soviet Union leaders would honestly answer no. Of course they'd answer yes. But the interesting point is that so would Jimmy Carter, and so would any other ruler. This desire to rule the world is simply a general characteristic of politicians and rulers and heads of state. Nor, by saying that the Soviet Union has an intention to conquer the world, am I going to try to deny that the Soviet rulers have engaged in imperialism. They clearly have engaged in imperialism. Not only have they continued the czarist policy of imperialist domination of the minority groups within the Soviet Union, but they've imposed their imperial will over the client states in Eastern Europe. However, the interesting things to note about Soviet imperialism are, first of all, that it's been conservative. It's mainly been an effort to maintain the status quo since the end of World War II. And secondly, that it's been confined to Soviet borders. And I think both of these facts clearly reflect the essential defensive nature of Soviet imperialism. Even the initial takeover of Eastern Europe was partially a response to U.S. initiatives. During the war, you may remember, Stalin was our ally, our noble ally, and part of the agreement among the three powers, Europe, uh, rather England, the U.S., and the Soviet Union, during the war was that at the end of the war, all the defeated nations would be jointly occupied by the three powers. The first country to break that agreement was not the Soviet Union, but the United States, which broke it in relationship to Italy, which happened to be the first country to be liberated, but the United States allowed Russia no part in Italy. And thus, Stalin naturally drew the conclusion that the, the U.S. was in favor of dividing up the world into spheres of influence. Now, if the USSR were really bent on world conquest, those who believe this have some interesting problems to to answer. Like why after World War II did the USSR withdraw its troops, its occupation troops from Finland, eastern Austria, and northern Iran? Why after World War II did Stalin restrain and hold back the communists in France, Greece, and Italy, although the communists had formed the bulk of the resistance movements in those countries? Stalin also tried to restrain the communists in Yugoslavia, Tito in Yugoslavia, and Mao Zedong in China, but uh, Tito and Mao refused to go along with Stalin requests in these matters. Even the invasion of Afghanistan fits into the conservative pattern, and, and that's one of the reasons that I brought this, and I've got lots of extra copies of it. It's got an excellent article on the invasion of Afghanistan. This is Liberty, put out by Students for a Libertarian Society, which will help reassure those of you who are worried about the invasion of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has been a Russian client state since the Tsar, and the interesting thing is that when the Soviet Union moved, finally moved troops in, they moved troops to overthrow a government that was too communist for them, too red for them, and that it was alienating the population because of its repressive policies. And they replaced it with a, with a more moderate communist regime. In fact, I think that if you look at the world since World War II, and you look at U.S. imperialism versus Soviet imperialism, I think you'll conclude, if you look at it objectively, that the U.S. has appeared to be a greater threat to the USSR than vice versa. U.S. hostility to the Soviet Union has been manifest since 1918 when the U.S. joined the British and other allies in military intervention to support the white Russians and suppress the Bolshevik Revolution. Since World War II, U.S. imperialism in marked contracts to Soviet imperialism has encompassed the entire globe, stretching to the very borders of the USSR. For instance, during the missile crisis, President Kennedy got alarmed at the discovery that the Soviet Union had missile bases, had just put missile bases in Cuba, which is 90 miles from the United States, ignoring the fact that the U.S. all along had had missile bases in Greece and Turkey, and Turkey is right on the border of the Soviet Union. A Brookings Study Institute entitled Force Without War by Barry Blechman and Stephen Kaplan have noted that from World War II to 1975, the U.S. has openly used or threatened the use of military force to achieve political ends around the world 215 times. This excludes, by the way, non-military intervention like the Marshall Plan, it excludes covert operations like the CIA coup in Iran, and it, and it also excludes intervention for direct military objectives like the war in Korea. Uh, interestingly enough, out of these 215 incidents 
the threat of using nuclear, the strategic nuclear forces was exercised 33 times. A Brookings study finds that during the same period that the USSR has 115 similar incidents. Okay, that covers Soviet intentions. As for Soviet capabilities, I don't know how much I should devote to this. I guess a little bit on the background. If you look at the history of the arms race, you'll discover that the United States government has consistently overestimated Soviet capabilities. We were told about a bomber gap in the early 1950s that turned out to be an utter and, and complete myth. We were told about a missile gap in the early 1960s. Subsequently, the Air Force had to reduce its estimates of Soviet missiles to 3.5% of their <laughs> original figure. The missile gap turned out to be a total myth, except for the fact that there did exist a missile gap in the other direction in favor of the United States. Howard Katz, in a book, The Warmongers, which is not a very good book on the whole, does do something interesting with U.S. News and World Report. He goes through it during the entire Cold War period. Those of you who aren't familiar with it, U.S. News and World Report is sort of at the leading edge of Cold War militarism in terms of alarmism about the Soviet Union. What he discovers is that consistently U.S. News and World Report will write articles about the Soviet threat saying, Five years ago, we were way ahead of the Soviet Union, but now they're quickly catching up, and they will surpass us if we don't watch out. And they say such things in 1950, and they say such things in 1955, and they say such things in 1960. Always five years, we were way ahead of them, but now they're quickly catching up, which is, of course, what we're being told now. In terms of nuclear power, we're being told that the Soviet Union has a greater throw rate in missiles, which ignores the fact that if you include bombers, the U.S. has a greater throw weight in terms of nuclear capability, that the Russians need a heavier throw weight because they have inferior non-miniaturized guidance systems and heavier, more primitive bombs. We are told that the Soviet Union outclasses us in equivalent megatonnage. That again doesn't include bombers. It also ignores the fact that the United States has about 4,000 equivalent megatons in its strategic nuclear arsenal. McNamara's estimate was that 400 equivalent of megatons would destroy 70% of Soviet industry and 35% of the population. We're told that the, the Soviet Union has more missile launchers than we do 1,710 to 2,348. This also ignores bombers, but it ignores the most important indicator of strategic capability, which is warheads, in which the United States has always been superior. Right now, the figures stand at 11,000 warheads to 5,000 warheads for the Soviet Union. But then uh, the militarists pull out the SS-18, and they tell us that now the Soviet Unions have developed a missile which is so accurate that it has a first strike capability, and it can hit all our Minutemen and Titan missile sites, and thus launch a devastating first strike against the United States. Well, the SS-18 is indeed an awesome weapon. It carries either an 18 to 25 megaton warhead or eight two megaton warheads about uh, 6,300 miles with a circular error of probability, that's abbreviated CEP, of 0.25 to 0.12 nautical miles. That's the radius within which 50% of the warheads are expected to fall. But the interesting thing to note about this is that even if a Russian attack succeeded in the near impossible, in other words, even if a Russian attack went off flawlessly and wiped out all our Minuteman and Titan missiles, wiped out all our long-range bombers, and wiped out all our nuclear-powered missile-launching submarines that were not on station, which is about 40% of them for the United States. By the way, the Soviet Union only has 10% of its nuclear-powered subs on station at any one time. 90% of them are in port, as opposed to 40% for the United States. Even with the remaining 60% of the, of the U.S. nuclear-powered submarines, that would still leave the United States with 3,000 warheads. And that means that we have still 12 or 12 warheads, actually more than 12 warheads for each Soviet city with a population over 100,000. And I know this for a fact because I counted <laughs> all the Soviet cities with a population over 100,000 in my atlas. There are 245 of them, in case any of you are interested. Actually, it's not the Soviet Union that's moving towards a first strike capability, it's the United States. Consider, for instance, the, the proposed Trident submarine. A Trident submarine will be able to carry 24 Trident II missiles. The Trident II missile, when it's fully operational, will carry 17 100 kiloton warheads. Each of those are five times as powerful as the bomb dropped at Hiroshima. It will have a range of 4,500 4, nautical miles, a circular error probability of 0 0.015 nautical miles, or 90 feet, if it uses the new MARV warheads that the United States is developing which uh, are capable of evasive action and celestial navigation and incredible accuracy. That's incredible accuracy for a submarine-launched missile. One Trident sub will be able to destroy 408 targets, 30 Trident subs, 
will be able to destroy 12,240 targets. The MX is also a first strike weapon. In terms of conventional forces, the degree of exaggeration is the same. We're told that the Soviet Union has 4.4 million people in its armed forces. The United States has 2.1 million. Ignored is the fact that 950,000 of those are part of the Strategic Rocket Command and Air Defense Forces. 500,000 of them are border guards or security troops. 600,000 of them are stationed in the Far East against China. 700,000 of them have civilian functions, leaving available for conflict in Europe 2.1 million men, as opposed to the U.S. availability for conflict in Europe of 1.9 million men. Now, of course, we don't have all those troops over there. And when you include the Allies, we're often told that NATO has only 28 and a third divisions in Europe, while the Warsaw Pact has 58 and a third divisions. Again, the things that are ignored are the size of divisions, the higher state of re readiness of U.S. divisions, the better maintained equipment, the better logistics, the better training, the reliability of European allies. It's, it's pretty clear that the Warsaw Pact nations would join the Soviet Union in a defensive war, but not in an aggressive war. And that in terms of manpower, the figures are pretty even. Again, 1.363 million men for uh, NATO, 1.294 million men for uh, the Warsaw Pact. Tanks, aircraft, I could go on. Naval forces, we're told that the Soviet Union has 486 naval vessels, while the United States only has 247. However, most of the Soviet naval vessels are very small. In terms of tonnage, the U.S. outclasses the Soviet Union two to one. And in terms of power projection forces like carriers, aircraft carriers, the United States has 13. Do you know how many the Soviet Union has? Zero. <laughs> Zero aircraft carriers, unless you want to count the four pseudo-aircraft carriers that the Soviet Union has that are capable of launching helicopters and vertical lift aircraft. All of the U.S. aircraft carriers are, are of course, are capable of launching high-performance aircraft. In terms of sea lift, the United States has 64 amphibious assault vehicles, which can carry 944,000 tons, carrying one to two full divisions with their equipment, and these have a global range. The Soviet Union has nothing comparable to that in terms of sea lift. In fact, the U.S. outclasses the Soviet Union in nearly every respect, in, every, in nearly every respect in terms of military. And the defensive nature of Soviet policies is clear from analyzing their, their military as in addition to analyzing the history of their actions. The Soviet military is mainly designed for defense. That's why they have a lot of small coastal vessels in their navy. That's why they don't need carriers and amphibious assault vehicles for power projection to project imperialism halfway around the world the way the United States does. Soviet troops, for the most part, must operate in areas contiguous to Soviet borders. And at this point, I want to recommend a really excellent book it's by the Boston Study Group. It's entitled The Price of Defense, and they go through a much more detailed analysis. It's one of the first of comparative military capabilities of the two sides. And what they conclude, the book is not radical enough, as far as I'm concerned. What they conclude is that the U.S. defense budget could be cut by 40%, and that the United States could still maintain a viable commitment to NATO and a viable commitment to Japan. A 40% cut and still maintain a commitment to NATO and commitment to Japan. Of course, libertarians favor withdrawing from NATO and, and eliminating the commitment to Japan. Even more drastic cuts would be possible. Probably 90% of the defense budget could be successfully cut out. I'm almost through with this point, <laughs> the exaggerated need for national defense. Everything that I've said so far talks about how the danger has been exaggerated. I also want to state that the consequences of foreign conquest are also exaggerated. If you reflect on history a little bit, nobody gives a damn who won the War of the Roses. Nobody cares about the Norman Conquest. And historians, you'll discover, put very little emphasis on wars as a source of change in history. Now, why is this? I think that if you look at history, well, we'll get to why later in my talk, but I think if you look at history, you'll, you'll find that more disruption and misery has been caused by the actual process of fighting wars than from the consequences of the outcomes of those wars. And that in most cases, the defeated nation would have been better off not fighting the war in the first place, or at least not fighting it through a nascent state and allowing conquest to occur, as opposed to the rulers of the opposing countries. The masses of the people had very little interest in the outcome of the war, and their lives would have been very little affected by a change in rulers. Their lives were, of course, affected by the process of fighting the wars. A lot of them got killed. The need for national defense is exaggerated, but I'm willing to admit the theoretical possibility that there might be somewhere somewhere in history where I haven't discovered it, a genuine case <laughs> of where national defense or, uh, or something comparable is necessary. Now, 
The problem with military history is that most rational and normal people consider military history, if not unpleasant and un unoffensive, at least rather dull. And so the study of military history has been monopolized pretty exclusively by militarists, people who are into guns and tanks and that sort of thing. And thus they tend to overemphasize the strictly military factors whenever they're discussing military history. And at this point I have a confession to make. Unlike most rational and normal people, I like military history. I've read a lot about it. I even used to play Avalon Hill war games. <laughs> and I've also had military experience being a tank platoon leader in the army. So I, I'm generally better equipped than most anti-war people to discuss these issues. And what I'm going to argue now is that the strictly military factors are not as important as three other factors that I'm going to focus in on in determining the outcome of any armed conflict. And that in all three of these factors, an anarchist society would have an advantage over a status society. Now the first factor is obvious, economics. The importance of economics to, to the outcome of a war hasn't been denied by anyone. It's important for two reasons. It determines the quantity of resources that the warring countries have at their disposal and also partially determines the level of technology. Now, those of you who are libertarians won't need to be convinced of the economic superiority of the free market. Those of you who aren't libertarians, again, I don't have the time to make the case. Simply what I'll argue is that socialism or any other form of statism is inefficient because it hurts economic allocation or calculation. It causes a misallocation of resources and that is the primary explanation for the current superiority of the United States over the USSR in terms of military capability. A prosperous society has more resources to devote to fighting a war. But one of the most important determinants in how prosperous a society is, is government policy, or the actions of the state. And one of the most harmful and most important aspects of state intervention in the economy are the amount of resources that are wasted on a parasitic military establishment. This leads to the interesting conclusion that if you reduce military spending, you increase the prosperity of the economy, and therefore you increase the military capability, the amount of resources that the society has at its disposal, you increase its ability to engage in armed conflict, and vice versa. In short, what I argue is the less the government spends on the military, the better prepared, other things being equal, for armed conflict any nation will be. I call this Hummel's first law of armed conflict, <laughs> rather pompously, because it's been suggested by other people. The less the government spends on the military, other things being equal, the better prepared for armed conflict any nation or country will be. Now let me give some examples to illustrate this point. It may sound preposterous to you. U.S. history. The militarists who write about the military history of the United States always marvel at the performance of the United States. Prior to World War II, the United States went into every single war completely, totally, woefully unprepared because the United States had demilitarized after the previous war. Yet the United States managed nearly always to win every single war. It's only since World War II that we've consistently lost. It's only been World War II since we've kept a peacetime military establishment. And the militarists think that this is an amazing coincidence in the United States, you know, just amazingly lucky. They always manage to, <laughs> to get through by the skin of their teeth, you know. They should have been prepared, they weren't prepared, but the consequences of not being prepared didn't hurt them. Well, I don't think it's a coincidence. I believe that it's causally linked. For instance, take the Mexican War again. Now, I said that the, the Mexican government thought they could win the Mexican War. Why did they think they could win the Mexican War? Well, because at the outbreak of the Mexican War, the Mexican government had a standing army of 32,000 men. The United States at the outbreak of the Mexican War had a standing army of 7,365 men. That meant that at the outbreak of the Mexican War, Mexico had a better than four to one advantage over the United States in terms of military establishment. Yet not only did the United States win that war, it won nearly every single engagement. And the reason is not hard to find. The reason was obviously the economic superiority of the United States. It was a far more prosperous, far richer country, able to devote very few resources to fighting the war and still pursue other endeavors. Now, why was the United States so prosperous compared to Mexico? Why was Mexico a poor and stagnant third-rate country? Well, one of the primary reasons is because the Mexican economy had been burdened with a huge parasitic military establishment of 32,000 men. <laughs> For a country of Mexico's size, that was an incredible burden. And that's one of the primary sources of, of Mexico's poverty. Another example, what's been the most successful empire in the history of Western civilization since the fall of the Roman Empire? The British Empire. 
in the 19th century. Yet at the height of its power, Britain was never highly militarized. The U.S. empire has been the most successful empire in the 20th century, and although the United States has been militarized during that period, it's very clear that it's running on the steam from its earlier, freer years, and that it's less militarized than many of its opponents. One very common analysis among libertarians that's been promoted by Ayn Rand, although she's not the only one, has a superficial ring of truth to it, and it's the analysis that runs a country that has the internally the worst status policies will also tend to be the most aggressive on the international scene. A lot of libertarians have attacked that, saying that it's a priori history, but I think that it's wrong not only if you examine the evidence, but it's also wrong for very good theoretical reasons. The reason that it's not true is because statism produces domestic crises that make any government less capable of foreign intervention. And so I've come up with a corollary of Hummel's first law, that generally in any conflict between relatively free and relatively status countries, the government in the relatively free countries will tend to be the more aggressive, interventionist, and imperialistic. And that's true when I examine history, it seems to be true, and it, it follows logically from the fact that not only do the ruling classes in the relatively free country have greater resources to throw around, but also, since the ruling class in the relatively free country has been more restrained in terms of the exploitation of its own citizens that it can engage in, has greater incentives to exploit foreigners. Now, what I'm going to try to do in each of these points, as I go through them, is show that reducing the power of government not only will give long-range advantages, but also short-term advantages. The short-term advantages from reducing the power of government in the economic realm, I don't think I need to go into in any great detail. As I said, that's the reason for the current superiority of the U.S. over the USSR. Unfortunately, if our government pursue, continues in its economic policies, continues to squander mo money on defense as well as squander money on other things, we're in danger of wrecking our economy, which of course will put us in danger of being overtaken by the Soviet Union. In the long term, I believe that a truly laissez-faire free market society, an anarcho-capitalist society, would be so prosperous, so technologically advanced, so economically superior, that the difference between it and our current state capitalist or state socialist societies would be on the order of the magnitude, economically, of the current difference between the U.S. and a country like Zaire in Africa or Mexico in uh, Latin America. That, in other words, attack would be almost economically unfeasible for any potential aggressor. Whatever standby protection was necessary, and I don't think it would be very much, could be provided at minimal cost through voluntary funding of private protection agencies. Okay, now at this point, three objections spring up, <laughs> usually. One, how could private protection agencies be funded when defense is a public good? Two, what about nuclear weapons? Three, what would prevent private defensive agencies from becoming government? Well, I'm going to defer the answer to number three until I get to ideology, or rather politics. And uh, I'll take on the first two. The public good argument, by the way, I think is the trickiest argument for uh, national defense in a libertarian society. It's been raised by David Friedman, who is an anarchist. And it's based on the notion a public good is a service that you cannot provide to one individual without providing it to a whole bunch of individuals. The typical example is a dam, a dam that provides flood control for a whole bunch of farmers living below the dam. It's not a very good example, but it's the typical one, and so I'll use it. And the reason that this is a problem, supposedly, is that because the good can't be provided to one individual without being provided to all individuals, there's an incentive for individuals to try to be free riders, to not pay for the good because they know if everybody else pays for it, they'll get it anyway. And the problem with that incentive is that if enough people try to be free riders, the good won't be produced. And so the argument against the market is the market underproduces public good. I think that there are four ways that the market can get around the public good problem. First of all, through a reallocation of property titles. The dam example illustrates this very clearly. If you have a whole bunch of farmers living below the dam, then obviously you can't provide the services of the dam to one of them without providing them to all of them. But if an, if an enterprising entrepreneur comes up and buys up all the land below the dam, then builds the dam, then resells it for its increased value, the public good problem is solved. Now, there are certain other problems with that that I won't get into, but that's at least one way of getting around it. Charity is another way of getting around public good problems. 
And there are lots of examples of functioning charity that provides services in our society for public goods. The best common example being tipping. Good service in a restaurant is a public good. You don't get the benefits from the tip that you give, and yet most people tip because of social pressures. Another way of getting around the public goods problem is alternative means of funding. Most people who talk about public goods have a very narrow notion of the market, and I think they underestimate the versatility of the market. For instance, in our dam case, the dam, instead of selling flood control, can generate electricity and provide that service. Another, much better example of a public good in our society is television. If you start beaming out television signals over the airwaves, you can't beam it to one person without beaming it to a whole bunch of people. This problem has been solved. It's a public good that's been provided through advertising in our society. A final way that the public goods problem, and I think the most important point to make in this issue, is public goods depend on technology. A pay TV illustrates this really clearly. You have two types of TV. One form is a public good. Pay TV is not a public good. That's a private good. Government intervention into defense has created a technological skew. Because of the way government wages war, it's created a demand for providing defense through offensive weapons. And if you provide defense through offensive weapons, by their nature, you make national defense into a public good. And I think that, that in an anarchist society, the demand for non-public good means of providing national defense would be quickly manifested in new technologies that were capable of resolving the public good problem. In other words, capable of providing national defense to some people without providing it to others who hadn't paid for it. So I don't see any reason why this is a serious objection to uh, the voluntary funding of national defense. The second objection I said I was going to talk about is nuclear weapons. And this is a, this is a tricky one. What are we going to do about nuclear weapons or nuclear blackmail? But the thing to note about it is that currently we have no defense against nuclear weapons. The United States, the USSR, no nation in the world has any defense against nuclear weapons. What we have that passes for a defense is called the deterrence. Deterrence does not defend you against being wiped out by nuclear weapons. All it does is threaten to wipe out someone else, threaten to hold someone else hostage, and then, as long as the buttons aren't under the control of madmen or people who are willing to take um, incredible risks, then the buttons won't be pushed. I think that the strategic nuclear weapon is a monument um, to statism. It is the most chilling example of the results, the devastating results, of having national defense provided by government. <laughs> Um, nuclear weapons would never have been de developed if it hadn't been for the demand created for them by government. They're one of the best examples of this technological skew that I was talking about. And I think if anything indicates the pressing need for getting rid of governments, it's the fact that they've, um, they've blessed us with nuclear weapons. Because with uh, increasing, improving technology, who knows what they're going to bless us with next. Um, eventually, of course, a libertarian society, I think, will need some kind of effective true defense against nuclear weapons. I don't think that that's without, outside the range of possibility. Um, I think if the need is great, the market re will respond. We already see some kinds of technologies that may, may be possible to work in that direction. Particle beams, um, satellites um, mounting uh, missile killing lasers, other things like this. A lot of this may sound like science fiction, but the interesting question for you to consider is, in which society is there going to be greater incentive to develop such weapons? Is there any incentive in a state of society to develop effective defenses against nuclear weapons? And then compare that with the, with the incentives that will be created for inventors and entrepreneurs to come up with effective defenses against nuclear weapons in a free market anarchist society. Um, and at this point, I want to draw out one of the implications of my disagreement with uh, limited government libertarians. David Nolan, when he heard I was going to give this talk, who's, who's the, one of the founders of the Libertarian Party, sent me a copy of a talk he wrote, on, or an article he wrote on national defense. And he said, he said many of the same things that I'm saying, but he also said what we really need to do is get the government to start building truly defensive weapons. And he he gave the example of um, satellites carrying 
uh, missile killing lasers. Now I find that <coughs> suggestion flawed because I don't want the government developing such a weapon. If, the we if such a weapon is going to provide defense, I want it developed on the free market. As an anarchist, I don't want such a weapon to ever be in the hands of, of any government. Uh, if the government couldn't turn it to offensive use, first of all, the develop if it were developed by the government, the development would be far more inefficient and wasteful. Um, and also, if the government is given the power to develop it, not only will it, could the government possibly convert it to offensive use, but the government can take any defensive weapons and use it in conjunction with its offensive weapons to make it off, its offensive capability uh, much more formidable. Uh, therefore, I would argue that while the need for effective defense against nuclear weapons is, is great, libertarians, if they're consistent, must oppose all efforts by the state, by government, to develop um, new weapon systems, even those which appear to be ostensibly defensive. Now, until the day when a free market society comes up with effective, viable defense against nuclear weapons, we're all going to live under the nuclear sword of Damocles. And you have two alternatives. Those of you who want to can put your faith in nuclear deterrence. You can pay your monthly premium to Poseidon Submarine Company, um, which could provide on the market a nuclear deterrence at the fraction of the current cost. Um, others of those, like myself, who find the concept of um, nuclear deterrence inherently immoral because it involves uh, the threatening of the mass murder of innocent victims, um, will put our defense in the other two factors, the ideological and the political, which I'll now proceed um, to go on to. Ideological. The importance of ideological factors in conflict stem from the importance of population. Now again, nobody denies that population is an important determinant in the outcome of any kind of war. But usually the people who talk about population are subscribers to the brute force rules, the world school, <laughs> of which most militarists fall into. They either count up crude population figures or they count up the size of the armies or the number of guns and stuff like that. And what they forget, what they always forget, is that guns are wielded by people and people have ideas, and if you change people's ideas, they're going to turn their guns around. That is the importance of ideology. Ideology determines how much of its population any government will be able to effectively mobilize in a war, the effective population. Now, most people tend to treat this ideological factor as exogenous. That's an economic <coughs> term for outside the system, given. But I don't think it is. I think it's endogenous, and I'll show how. First, I want to talk about the short term. Now, in order to describe the operation of the ideological factor in the short term, I need to digress a little bit and talk about government, because I think the ideological factor puts constraints on government. And then we'll discuss how these constraints can be altered. I define a government as a legitimized monopoly on coercion. Now, we can quibble about that definition, but the aspect of that definition I want to focus in on now is legitimized. The main thing that distinguishes the government's protection racket from a criminal protection racket is that most people think the government is legitimate. Most people think it's a good thing. In fact, I would argue that all societies have a consensus, unless people are actually killing each other off. All societies have a consensus, and that part of that consensus is the ideology that legitimizes the particular government. Now, Rand has a particularly apt term for this legitimization, the sanction of the victim. The legitimization of government is the sanction of the victim. And for those of you who still don't understand what I mean or may have doubts about its distinction from coercion, whenever I try to illustrate this point to an audience, usually it's an audience of non-libertarians, so it works, <laughs> I ask uh, how many people in the audience would pay your taxes if the taxes were voluntary, and uh, no hands go up, or maybe one or two. There are one or two people who would pay their taxes if taxes were voluntary. Then I ask the audience, how many people in the audience feel that taxes are necessary, or good things, or, um, or needed, and every hand goes up. And that's the sanction of the victim. People are not voluntarily paying taxes, but, the, but it still has their sanctions. All governments have the sanctions of their victims. All governments are legitimized. And this holds true whether the governments are ostensibly democratic 
or whether the governments are ostensibly dictatorial. Now, recently, political scientists have discovered that democratic governments are not as democratic as we once thought, and that, <laughs> and that they're really ruled by elites and not by the people. And if this is true, the question comes up, what restrains Jimmy Carter? If Jimmy Carter tomorrow decided that he was going to order the U.S. Army into Congress to shoot down every congressman who opposed his registration program, and then introduced a bill that made him dictator for life and called off the elections and dissolved Congress and forced them to pass it at gunpoint, what stopped Jimmy Carter from taking this action? Well, the first answer that a lot of you will give is false. It's not a scrap of paper called the Constitution. Pieces of paper, written words, don't stop anybody from doing anything. It's only if those written words are believed by people. Jimmy Carter couldn't get away with that action because most of the American people wouldn't stand for it. It would be outside the consensus. It wouldn't be legitimized. He wouldn't even probably get the army to follow his orders. And even if he could get the army to follow his orders, the masses of the American people would just revolt. That is really the only effective constraint on the power of Jimmy Carter or on the power of any ruler, any government, the ideological factor. And it works just as well on the rulers of the Soviet Union as it does on the rulers of the United States. The, the precise consensus within which they're working, the precise ideology within which they're working may be different, but the fact that there is a consensus which puts effective constraints on their actions is true in both cases. Thus, the USSR is not as dictatorial as we thought. It has to take certain actions in order to maintain the support of the various factions within the USSR and of the significant parts of the population. Now, when you recognize this, I think you can begin to realize how the current policy of the United States government is designed to push the ideological constraints which bind the rulers of the USSR in the wrong direction. What has been the greatest source of increasing power in this country, in the United States, for militarists today? Obviously, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Nothing more has contributed to militarism in this country. Just as American militarists depend upon the alleged Soviet threat to gain support from the American people, Soviet militarists depend upon the alleged United States threat to gain support from the Soviet people. Now, there are a couple of examples, illustrations of this principle in operation. For instance, there's considerable evidence now that, in fact, the invasion of Afghanistan was pushed by a new hardline clique within the Soviet Union that's gotten more power directly as a result of Jimmy Carter's actions against detente. His hysterical cacophony about the Soviet troops in Cuba, his increases in the defense spending, his toying with the neutron bomb, and most importantly, his decision to deploy the Pershing II missile, which can hit the Soviet Union in Europe. Another example of the operation of this principle, turn around the globe and go to China. Now, when we were fighting the Vietnam War, we told that it was necessary to fight the Vietnam War because of China. That if, in fact, we didn't win in Vietnam, one, China would expand, Two, China would become more hardline communist. And three, U.S. and Chinese relations would deteriorate. <laughs> well, in fact, after the U.S. defeat in Vietnam, after the removal of U.S. presence from that proximity to the Chinese, the exact opposite of all those three things happened. China has been increasingly hemmed in by its communist neighbors. China has had a decline in its hardline communist policies as represented by the rise to power of Chen Yun. He became deputy premier and head of the State Finance Council. He's an economist who talks about socialist prices and socialist profits. And of course, relations have improved between the United States and China. In short, what I'm arguing is that the buildup of U.S. military power or the projection of U.S. military power around the world does not decrease the power of Soviet militarists or Chinese militarists. It increases it. And in fact, the most devastating blow that the U.S. could strike against the power of Soviet militarists is unilateral disarmament. 
People are supposed to gasp when I say that. <laughs> I'm going to generalize this into uh, Hummel's second law of armed conflict, <laughs> which reads, building up military strength to deter foreign attack increases the likelihood of such an attack. Demilitarization in the face of a threat is the best way to reduce the threat. Now, after I formulated this law, I, I got an interesting statistical confirmation, if you believe that statistics can confirm this kind of thing. I came across a book written by three authors entitled Military Deterrence in History. They did a correlation on 20 cases going back to Roman times on the effect of deterrence and concluded that there, and the outbreak of war, the relationship between deterrence and the outbreak of war, and they, they concluded that deterrence doesn't help deter the outbreak of war at all. Now, this ideological factor not only has made the United States less secure vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, but it's made the United States less secure vis-a-vis -vis the Third World in a slightly different way. A lot, of the, a lot of the fear of the Soviet threat depends on the confusion of Marxism, the spread of Marxism with the spread of Soviet imperialism. It is definitely true that the Marxist ideology has started to spread around, has actually spread around the world. And there are a lot of things responsible for that spread, but U.S. foreign policy must share in the responsibility. Why? Well, because the U.S. foreign policy since World War II has been designed to perform a neo-imperialistic kind of goal, replacing the colonial regimes which had retreated, by maintaining in power local ruling classes, feudal dictatorial despots in the third world. Now, the masses... The, the majority of people in these countries, as a result of this policy, both first by, by the formal imperialism of the European countries and by the imperialism of the United States, came to identify capitalism with statism, taxation, bureaucracy, and land monopoly, because this is what U.S. intervention has meant around the world. And as a result, since they don't like these things, they have gut reactions against them. They don't like being taxed. They don't like land monopolies. They don't like bureaucracy. And they don't like statism. They've turned to Marxism as the only revolutionary alternative. Now, interestingly enough, of course, Marxists have betrayed the peoples of the third world, giving them more statism, taxation, bureaucracy, and land monopoly. <laughs> and the result of that is that it's very clear that third world people are now beginning to turn away from Marxism and look for a third alternative. I think this explains why Marxism played such a small role in the revolution in Iran and revolutionary Islam played the major role. U.S. isolationism, a non-interventionist U.S. foreign policy, would give the peoples of the third world a truly revolutionary, rational third alternative. Intervent in effect, U.S. foreign policy intervention has made the U.S. hated and less secure, and isolationism would reverse that trend. Now, in the long term, I would argue that nothing would be more revolutionary than an anarchist libertarian America. It would shine as a beacon. <laughs> it would be an example to the rest of the world. People would try to emulate its success. The remaining nation states would be totally preoccupied with staving off rebellions, internal rebellions in their own country. They wouldn't have any time to devote to pose any serious threat to an anarchist United Non-States. I believe that if the, if, the, if the U.S. goes libertarian, libertarianism will spread around the world like Marxism, only faster because it's rational, and not through intervention, but through ideas, through ideology. Ideology also helps handle this question of the anarchist versus the militarized Luxembourg, because I, I, I think ideology would give an anarchist Luxembourg at least some kind of chance. It would give it a chance to draw upon needed aid either from individuals within a militarized Germany and France or from individuals elsewhere. And with this ideological weapon, um, Luxembourg has at least some kind of chance of maybe preventing uh, its takeover. A, mili a militarized Luxembourg, I think, is in a completely hopeless situation. Of course, in the final analysis, the problem of an anarchist Luxembourg is really part of a much more general problem that is obscured by our thinking in terms of state boundaries. The problem of, of an anarchist Luxembourg is simply the problem that any minority faces from a majority that is bent on oppression and exploitation, from an overwhelming majority that is bent on oppression and exploitation. 
And the problem is the same whether that minority happens to inhabit the same nation state as the majority or happens to inhabit a smaller neighboring nation state. There is very little that a persecuted minority can do to physically defend itself from an enraged, overwhelming majority. That's unfortunate, but it happens to be a fact of life. The only recourse of any persecuted minority is ideology, an ideology that either appeals to third parties to give aid to the persecuted minority or else undermines the oppressive designs of the majority itself. And, of course, libertarianism does both of these things. Okay, that finishes the ideological factor on to the political factor. Now, political factors are the anarchist society's last line of defense, and they stem from the ideological factors. Recognize that governments are legitimized. You realize that no government exists for very long once it loses the consensus, the sanction of the victims, the support of the people who live under it. Once it loses this sanction, it is quickly overthrown and replaced. Therefore, it is nearly impossible to impose on a people, on any people, an unwanted government. That's Hummel's third law of armed conflict. <laughs> it is nearly impossible to impose on a people an unwanted government. Those genuine cases of actual conquest, of actual imposition of a foreign government on a people fall into one of two categories. The first and most common category is the imposition of conquest through local, local ruling classes. This is the most common historically. Through local ruling classes that have the support of significant sections of the population within the country. And so it's not, in the, in the strictest sense of the world, we're at an un, unwanted government. And the, the conquering government uses the bureaucratic mechanism of the defeated government in order to impose its rule. A second way in which rule can be imposed on a people when they don't want it, this is genuinely when they don't want it, is again our Luxembourg case. If you've got an overwhelming majority support for a particular government somewhere else, then it can impose its will on a minority um, in another portion of the world. Now let me give some examples of, of the operation of this factor. The British conquest of India, very long, very successful. If you study it, you'll discover that it operated entirely through local ruling classes, through local rulers, through petty despots in the area. On the other hand, the British didn't find any local despots and rulers in Ireland to support their imperialism for them. And as a result, the actual conquest of Ireland by Britain, even though Britain had an overwhelming population advantage, took several centuries and finally didn't last very long. Another interesting contrast, American Indians. You can divide them roughly into two categories before the discovery of America by Europeans, those Indians in, in what's now Latin America and those Indians in what's now North America. The Spanish conquest of South America proceeded amazingly quickly, and historians still marvel at the feats of the conquistadores. People like Cortes, who in a period of three years was able to subdue all of central Mexico with 1,500 men, or in Peru, Pizarro, who in four years with fewer men crushed the Inca or subdued the Inca Empire. Now, this stands in marked contrast to North America, where the American Indians of North America were never really conquered. They were eventually driven off the land, and in fact, some of them were exterminated. All of these resulted from the overwhelming population advantage of English settlers, but they were never really conquered. Now, what explains this amazing difference? Well, you see, the Indians in South America were more civilized. They had highly developed state bureaucracies. <laughs> the North American Indians were uncivilized, and they had little formal government. Another example from U.S. history, contrast the Spanish-American War, in which the United States simply forced a, an opposing government to surrender, and the subduing of the Filipino insurrection, in which the United States actually imposed rule over a people who didn't want it. It took 70,000 troops in order to suppress the Filipino insurrection, as opposed to 10,000 troops to capture Manila in the first place from the Spanish and 17,000 to capture Cuba. The Filipino insurrection cost the United States 5,000 dead soldiers. Now that's the same number of dead soldiers that we got from the Spanish-American War, but the problem is, with that comparison, is that only 379 of those were battle casualties, the rest died of disease. So you here, again, have a comparison of, of the ease of, of toppling a government, but of the difficulty of imposing one that's not wanted. 
The Mexican War, it was easy for the U.S. government to topple the Mexican government if President Polk had gone in and accepted the demands of people who wanted us to annex all of Mexico, the United States would have found itself with practically an insurmountable problem imposing rule on the Mexican people. The decline of colonialism around the world since World War II, it's a result of the loss of consensus of the local ruling elites that were propping up the colonial regimes, and once the legitimization disappeared, the colonial rule began to evaporate. The final example of this political factor that I want to go into is is I think really important, it's from our own history, it's the American Revolution. How was it possible that Americans with a population of two and a half million defeated a nation of 11 million, that's England, at that time the most powerful military power in the world, it had the largest navy, it had a well-trained standing army of over 50,000 men supplemented by 30,000 Hessians. Well, I think the main reason is the political factor. Although the political factor almost lost us the Revolutionary War also. Because America pursued a schizophrenic military policy during the American Revolution. There was a conflict between the military radicals like Charles Lee and Daniel Morgan, who wanted to use guerrilla war, and the military conservatives like George Washington, who wanted to fight in the European fashion with standing armies that paraded in front of each other and mowed each other down. <laughs> now, because of the fear of standing armies, Washington's policy wasn't implemented to the extent that he would have liked. But Congress, nevertheless, did establish a Continental Army under Washington. And ever since then, the military historians who studied the American Revolution have focused on the fortunes of, of Washington's Continental Army as if it represented the fortunes of the American Revolution. And if they criticized it, they criticized it for not conforming to European standards of discipline and size and all of that. Well, I think that, in fact, the Continental Army was not really a very important factor in the American Revolution. It was never very large. Very few Americans served in it, and when they did, they usually deserted, except for a small hardcore. This small hardcore did prove a threat to liberty as the Newburgh conspiracy, which wanted to, uh, to put Washington in power as a dictator, shows. And most importantly, with the decision to finance a standing army came the need to, with the decision, rather, to maintain a standing army, came the need to finance that army. And how did the Continental Congress finance the army? They printed up paper money. And you all know about the Revolutionary War hyperinflation, which resulted in price control. Eventually, the army had to use confiscation to get war materials. And if anything came to close to losing the war for the United States, it was these policies of hyperinflation necessitated by a standing army. Now, if you look at the British commanders, if you look at the American Revolution from the point of view of the British commanders, you discover that they really didn't have much to fear from Washington's pitiful standing army. And that the real threat, the real danger that they felt they were facing was the militia. Now, the militia didn't work too well in campaigns of aggression. It failed miserably. The militia was used in an attempt to conquer Canada, not only in the Revolutionary War, but also in the War of 1812. But it was very effective in defensive campaigns. First of all, it maintained control of the countryside. Whenever there weren't British troops directly present, British government evaporated. Even with loyalists, the British were never main, able to maintain rule without the direct presence of troops. The militia engaged in guerrilla operations, which made life hazardous for small British formations, made the problem of logistics for the British troops a nightmare. They cut their supply lines and, for the most part, confined British troops to the ports of the United States. And finally, the militia always turned out in force when an opportunity presented itself to achieve an overwhelming victory. For instance, the first victory at Lexington and Concord is a very clear example of the militia turning out in force. But perhaps a better example is Saratoga, what's considered the turning point of the war in 1777, when Burgoyne started his march from Canada down into central New York with his army of about 7,700 men. There were no forces facing him to speak of. And yet, as Burgoyne himself said, every time that his troops turned in any particular direction, militia appeared out of nowhere from everywhere. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that, by the time Burgoyne had marched halfway down to Saratoga, the militia had managed to cut off Burgoyne's supply lines to completely and totally wipe out a uh, foraging uh, expedition that Burgoyne had sent off and defeat Burgoyne in two pitched battles and force him to surrender his entire force. Now, even in the final campaign where, we told, where we're told that uh, the French 
were the necessary ingredient for winning the war. They were important in that campaign, although I don't th I think we could have won the Revolutionary War without the French, especially if we hadn't had a Continental Army. Uh, but even in the final Yorktown campaign of 1781, the militia played a real important role in driving Cornwallis out of the south, out of the lower south, and up into Virginia, and harrying, harrying and harassing his forces. These are all examples of the political factor, the operation of it. Now, the interesting thing is that in most of these cases, the, the people who used this political factor to their advantage weren't consistent anarchists. They believed in government, it's just they didn't believe in the government that they were getting imposed upon them. And so I think that if it's nearly impossible to impose an unwanted government on a people who believe in some, but a different form of government, then how much more difficult is it going to be to impose a government on people who are committed strongly to no government at all? I think that this would be the anarchist's last line of defense. Revolutionary guerrilla war, or wars of national liberation, as conducted by citizen forces like the militia or something similar, would ensure that an anarchist society would not have its government develop, and also they would engage, the, the interesting implication of this is that they would engage in, in one type of warfare that escapes the moral dilemmas of wars between nation states. Because unlike wars between nation states, here, you have the people of Nation A rising up against the government of Nation A. And so you have at least the potentiality of pinpointing violence, at least on the part of the defenders, against true aggressors and not violating the rights of innocent bystanders. Now, I, I'm not going to go on to say that all wars of national liberation have conformed to this high standard, <laughs> this high ideal, and have not involved the violation of rights of innocent bystanders, but at least the potentiality is there. Now, I think that this would be an anarchist society's last line of defense. I don't think it would be necessary if, if a libertarian society encompassed any reasonably large area like America. I think the economic and ideological factors would suffice, uh, but nevertheless it would be there when needed. And also this political factor has some interesting implications that can tie up some of the loose ends that I've left in this talk. If you remember, I once said that the consequence, when I was talking about the exaggerated need for national defense, I, once, I said that the consequences of foreign conquest were exaggerated. And this, of course, is the reason, because unwanted governments are hard to impose on people. I also said that the domino theory is untrue, and I think that this is the reason. This factor sets the limits of viable imperialism. In other words, imperialism is viable so long as one, it maintains the loyalty of local collaborationist ruling classes, or two, it is based on a core majority that overwhelms the minority being subjugated. In other words, once the empire begins to approach the point where minority people who don't accept the rule of the government begin to equal a number, um, the majority of the people who endorse it, the empire becomes unstable. This is also the reason that I don't think there's any threat from private protection agencies from becoming government. Ideology, as it's the restraint on governments, it will also be the effective restraint on private protection agencies. And the fourth implication follows from this point. I said earlier the concept of national defense does not strictly apply to an anarchist society. Well, this, this sort of illustrates why. National defense is really only part of a much broader problem for any anarchist society. How does the anarchist society prevent the reintroduction of government? How does it prevent the reemergence of a new state? It's irrelevant whether that state has domestic sources or foreign sources, whether it has a domestic origin or foreign origin. The limiting factor is the consensus, is the ideology, is the sanction of the victim. And the only time that it has any chance of success is when the new state has significant sources of support, ideological support, either domestically or from foreign people. Right, yes, okay. I've discussed these three factors. I'm now into, into my conclusion. Now, most of the examples I've tried to use have been attempts to isolate one of the factors, although that's not possible. I mean, all of these factors operate all the time, although some of them are more flagrant. And I've tried to take examples that isolate them. What I'd now like to do is give an example of, of uh, give a recent example where all three factors operate together and see the outcome. They actually operate on different sides. And the example I'm considering is the Vietnam War. Clearly in the Vietnam War, the U.S. had the economic advantage. Now why did the U.S. lose the Vietnam War? 
Well, we're told by the anti-war movement that the U.S. lost the Vietnam War because it was attempting to impose an unwanted government on a people. In other words, the political factor. Militarists answer, no, no. <laughs> we lost the war because we didn't try hard enough. And we didn't try hard enough because of the anti-war movement. That's the ideological factor. Now, as far as these two explanations go, I think the anti-war movement has, is much closer to the truth than the militarists, but I don't want to discount the importance of the factor that the militarists identify altogether. Both of them work together, and thus we see that a combination of ideological and political factors, um, advantages for Vietnam, managed to overcome an economic advantage for the United States. An anarchist society, as I said, would combine an overwhelming advantage in all three, economic, ideological, and political. Therefore, I would 